welcome uh, to today's uh, IWCS uh, webinar. My name is Dave Cadu, and I'm honored to be the CEO of IWCS, and I'll be your moderator uh, for today's uh, webinar event. As, as you know, our uh, IWCS webinar series event is hosted by the Cable and Connectivity Industry Forum, which is coming up in, in a few short weeks, the first week in October. We hope that you have on to our website and found information on the tremendous uh, uh, program that we have established, uh, over 75 excellent technical papers. And uh, the paper you're gonna be hearing today was presented at last year's conference, uh, but there will be a follow-up presentation as well this year. Uh, it's still a very, very topical event. So in today's, um, Webinar, we welcome Mike Bodds, uh, who is a testing engineer at Burke Tech uh, Leviton in Pennsylvania, USA. Uh, he will be presenting his paper on twisted pair Ethernet applications at lengths greater than 100 meters. Uh, Mike uh, received his Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering and Biomedical Engineering from Drexel University in 2017. And he joined Burke Tech uh, uh, and currently works uh, as a test engineer uh, since uh, 2016. So again, Mike, uh, well, I first also wanna mention that if you want to see the actual paper that Mike will be presenting, it's paper 5-4 from the 2020 conference. So you can go on our archives page at uh, iwcs.org and you can find uh, Mike's paper there uh, to read in more detail. So with that, Mike, uh, you want to take control and uh, again, thank you for, for presenting your, your excellent paper today uh, to this. Of course. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Go ahead and share my screen here. All right. I believe I'm sharing the proper screen now. So good morning, everybody. As Dave said, my name is Michael Dodds and I'll be presenting on a paper that I co-authored for IWCS last year entitled Twisted Pair Ethernet Applications at Lengths Greater Than 100 Meters. So just to give you a brief overview of what I'll be talking about this morning, uh, I'll start with an introduction for the topic at hand and I'll provide a few thoughts on the <clears throat> relationship between extended distance applications and current IEEE standards. I'll delve into the test setup. I'll describe what our procedure was, uh, some operational definitions so you can sort of better understand uh, what exactly we're looking at, uh, what standards specifically we looked at for testing, what cables we use for testing, uh, what active equipment was involved with the testing, and then I'll get into our results and the conclusions that we could derive from them. So in theory, Meeting an IEEE 802.3 standard should mean that you can yield a uh, compliant connection. Uh, and a lot of times those specifications include length and a lot of times that length is 100 meters. Uh, however, some network devices are a little agnostic to actual channel length. Uh, they can measure delay between endpoints, which depends on the nominal velocity of propagation, uh, but that varies between cables. So there's no actual direct measurement of length. Uh, so there's a question of how important it actually is. Uh, we know that certain cable types can meet other specs beyond uh, 100 meters. So for example, a 22 gauge cable can easily meet the 1000 base C insertion loss requirement well beyond 100 meters. And we also know that there is mitigation built into layer one chipsets because like all standard compliant components, layer one chipsets operate with at least some kind of margin. So on paper, Extended length applications seem possible from a link segment perspective, but how well do actual network devices support these extended distance applications uh, is the question that we're looking to answer uh, in this paper. So, and that leads us to the actual questions of our study, which are how well can network devices actually support extended distance applications and what length dependent parameters and or cable design features are important for extended distance applications. And I will say that in our paper, we primarily looked at insertion loss and propagation delay because those are two uh, parameters that are very closely tied to the length of a, of a link segment. So in order to answer these questions, we compiled a large set of network devices and connected them with extended length 
uh, segments. And then we determined how many of those combinations could actually link up. And each combination was recorded as either a link or a no link. Uh, a link was defined as the devices providing some kind of visual confirmation that link had been established between them. And visual confirmation could come in the form of either the LEDs on the switch, an output from a command line interface, or a status reported by a visual GUI. And then no link was simply defined as the devices failing to provide uh, that visual cue within the allotted time. And the device combinations were given generally 15 to 45 seconds to establish link because we found that um, within the, the, test, the test bed of devices that we had, that's generally how long it took uh, for devices to establish link if possible. So in order to increase the variety of our test bed without drastically increasing the length of our experiment, we only looked at one port uh, per device. And the sole exception to this was when we uh, connected the, a device back to itself to uh, test that link. Um, previous testing that we've done has shown that there's little variation uh, among an individual device and the ports within that device. So in other words, if we had a 48 port switch that we were using for this testing, we didn't test all iterations of those 48 ports. Uh, though there were some switches that had multiple port types, and in that instance, each port type was treated as its own uh, unique device. So for example, we had an N-Base T switch, which had both uh, 10, 100, 1000 base T ports and N-Base T ports. So the 10, 100, 1000 base T ports were one device, one quote unquote device, and the N-Base T ports were another quote unquote device. Uh, I have an example there kind of just to illustrate what I'm talking about with the red ports there, uh, red ports highlighted on that switch being the 10, 100, 1000 base T ports and the blue ones being the N-Base T ports. And in terms of how we configured the switches uh, and network devices for, uh, data for the different data rates, uh, we had it forced and used no auto negotiation whenever possible. So now that you have a general idea of what we did, I'll provide a few operational definitions just to help better understand what I'm talking about. Uh, th there's a phrase that I'll be using a lot in my presentation called combination link percentage. And basically what that is, it's the percent, uh, percentage of devices that were able to establish link uh, at a given length and with a given data rate. So it's the number of network devices um, at that length that were able to establish that what we defined as link. And another one is more of a, uh, a more of a nomenclature kind of thing. So we use 100 base T in this presentation a lot, but that refers exclusively to 100 base TX, and that is mainly just to help with uh, shorthand. So the standards that we looked at were 10 base T, 100 base T, and 1,000 base T. For 10 base T, we examined 34 devices. Uh, and a total of 478 different combinations of devices. For 100 base T, we looked at 37 devices and 563 different combinations. For 1000 base T, 32 devices and 397 different combinations. And for 10, 100 and 1000 base T, they were all tested at full duplex. So we didn't look at half duplex in our uh, analysis here. And these transmission standards were chosen prim uh, primarily because they're supported by CAT5E, CAT6, and CAT6A link segments, which are among the most popular cable categories used, uh, at least in uh, North America. And we conducted our analysis with five different cables. And these cables had various uh, designs and categories associated with them. And we tested them at coiled lengths of 120, 146, 175, and 200 meter link segments. Uh, and they were all terminated with the same CAT6A field installable plug. And this particular plug was chosen because it had a OD large enough to accept all of the cables within the test set, uh, which allowed us to focus primarily on the cable properties and not what the actual uh, plug contributed to the, uh, the success rate of the different cables. Our test bed consisted of 42 different devices from 14 different manufacturers. And within the test set, we had uh, network switches, network interface cards, PoE power sourcing equipment, and PoE power devices. 
Uh, and of these devices, they had multiple port types associated with them. We had some devices with exclusively 10 100 base T, uh, 10 100 base T ports, uh, some that had 10 100 1000 base T ports, some that had the combination of 1000 base T and 10 G base T, 10 G base T ports, and some that were N base T ports. So the result of testing every applicable combination of 42 devices with five cables at four lengths across three transmission standards was a fairly comprehensive data set. So per length uh, for 1,000 base T, we looked at almost 2,000 different combinations. For 100 base T, we looked at uh, almost 3,000 different combinations. And for 10 base T, we looked at uh, about 2,400 different combinations. So in total, for 1,000 base T, that was almost 8,000 different combinations that we connected. For 100 base T, uh, it was over 11,000 different combinations. Uh, and for 10 base T, it was approximately 9,500 different combinations. Uh, and some of you might be wondering why we didn't examine bit error rate or, or frame error rate within this test. And the issue was simply time, uh, because if we wanted to actually evaluate the quality of those link segments, uh, those several thousand link segments would have taken a uh, rather long amount of time. So it just didn't fit within the, uh, the, the time constraints of our study. So on this slide here, I have a combination of a summary of CLP versus length for each cable uh, at each length for each transmission standard. And just a reminder that CLP stands for combination link percentage uh, and is the device combination, the percentage of device combinations that could establish link. Uh, so on the left there, we have 10 base T. Uh, in the middle, 100 base T or 100 base TX. And on the right is 1000 base T. So now to look at each of them individually. Uh, with 10 base T, uh, there really wasn't much of a difference between the 22 gauge and 23 gauge cables at 120, 146, and 175 meters. So the difference in combination link percentage between the two of those, uh, two of those groups, the average, uh, was less than 1%. So there really wasn't much of a difference in performance between the 22 gauge and 23 gauge combinations at those lengths. And even at 20, at uh, 200 meters, there wasn't much of a difference. It was a uh, approximately 3% difference in combination link percentage between the 22 gauge and 23 gauge cables. And then with 100 base T, it was a similar story. Uh, at 120, 146, and 147, uh, 175 meters, uh, the difference between the 22 gauge and 23 gauge cables was less than 1%. Though there's a little bit more of a difference uh, once we got out to 200 meters. So as opposed to 10 base T, where we only saw about a 3% difference in combination link percentage uh, with 100 base TX at 200 meters, we saw approximately a 6% difference. And then with 1,000 base T, uh, there really wasn't much of a difference observed at 120 meters and 146 meters. It was approximately a 1.5% difference between the two of them. Uh, though a little bit more separation was observed at 175 and 200 meters. So at 175, the difference between 22 gauge and 23 gauge and combination link percentage was approximately 17%. And at 200 meters, uh, it was uh, about 13%. So a little bit more separation there relative to 10 base C and 100 base TX uh, at 175 and 200 meters. So the previous slides uh, provided a summary of how well certain applications function between 120 and 200 meters, but now we're gonna look at how specific parameters influence combination link percentage. Uh, so the graph on the left there shows a theoretical relation between insertion loss margin uh, and combination link percentage. Uh, what I mean by insertion loss margin is the margin to the specific applications. So 10 base T, 100 base TX, 1000 base T. Um, and theoretically, you would see the percentage of devices that each link segment is able to link up with increase as your insertion loss margin increases as well until you get to a point where you reach a quote unquote sufficient margin, uh, at which point you should expect about 100% of the uh, combinations to be able to establish link. And the question is where that 
uh, sufficient margin line lies for each of the transmission standards that we looked at. Uh, because the following slides will concentrate on insertion loss margin, I just wanted to provide a quick summary of what insertion loss is defined as for 10 base T, 100 base TX, and 1,000 base T. Uh, so for 10 base T, the spec line simply spans from 5 to 10 megahertz and is defined as 11.5 dB. Uh, 100 base TX and 1,000 base T have the same spec line uh, defined by that equation right there. Uh, where F is the frequency in megahertz and spans between uh, one to 100 megahertz. And it's an approximation of the CAT5 uh, link segment spec for insertion loss. And what we found is that the combination link percentage versus insertion loss um, trace varied between the transmission standards. So similar to two slides ago, where I had the three separate graphs for 10, 100, and 1,000 base T, uh, I have here the insertion loss margin percentage and the combination link, combination link percentage uh, graphed for 10, 100, and 1,000 base T. Uh, so length there, or a combination link percentage is on the x-axis and insertion loss margin there is on the, sorry, combination link percentage is on the y-axis and insertion loss margin is on the x-axis there. So in the case of 10 base T, the uh, combination link percentage was not all the way up to 100% until well beyond the spec line for insertion loss for 10 base T. So the cable segment with the lowest uh, insertion loss margin that was able to link up with 100% of the devices wasn't able to do so until it had a, about a 25% margin to the 10 base T insertion loss spec line. So it was it had to be able to perform well beyond uh, the 10 base T insertion loss spec until it was able to link up with 100% of the devices that we tested. And this is at extended length. So uh, this isn't a, it, it's not like a 100 meter segment uh, with margin 10 base T was connected. Uh, you would expect that to be able to link up with 100% of the devices, but in extended length applications, uh, it needed a 25% margin in, able to, uh, in order to connect with 100% of the combinations that we tested. And 100 base T, on the other hand, uh, had a few points that were well below the insertion loss spec line, uh, one failing by more than 20% that was able to link up with 100% of the devices that we tested. Uh, and I have more on that later uh, in the conclusions. And with 1000 base T, it was a similar story to 10 base T, but not as extreme. Uh, basically, what we observed was that none of the cables under test were able to support 100% of the link combinations for 1,000 base T until they were well beyond the insertion loss spec line. Uh, so we only, we only actually had one uh, link segment uh, and length that was able to achieve 100% combination link percentage, and it wasn't able to do so until it had about a 17% 70, uh, margin uh, to the 1,000 base T insertion loss spec line. So another length dependent parameter that we looked at was propagation delay. Uh, and the table on the left there compares the combination link percentage of two different cables, cable D and cable E. Uh, both are 23 gauge cables, but cable D is gel filled. So the propagation delay is a bit greater just because of the dielectric properties of the gel uh, within the cable. Uh, and what we found was that there really wasn't uh, much of a noticeable trend with propagation delay versus combination link percentage. Um, across most of them, the difference in combination link percentage between cable D and cable E was less than 2.5%. Uh, in one instance, actually, at 175 meters with 1,000 base T, the uh, gel filled cable, despite having a propagation delay of about 128 nanoseconds greater then the gel-free cable was actually able to link up with about 13.4% more combinations than the uh, gel-free cable. So from these results, we can make a number of conclusions. Uh, the first one being that network devices are able to support extended distance applications, but they seem mostly beholden to IEEE 802.3 standards. Uh, 100 base T, isn't as dependent upon insertion loss, but with 10 base T and 1000 base T, 
uh, you saw that it, that the link segments required a significant margin to uh, the IEEE 802.3 spec in order to establish link with 100% of the combinations that we tested. Um, and in general, as insertion loss margin increases, so does your combination link percentage, which would make sense because as you uh, improve your performance relative to the application that you're trying to you're trying to establish, uh, you would expect to be able to link up with a higher percentage of devices uh, trying to transmit that application. Uh, another trend that we found was that as the data rate and length increases, the combination link percentage, that is the number of devices that you're able to establish link with, uh, goes down. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, we saw that propagation delay had a minimal effect on combination link percentage. Um, and in some cases, it, it seemed to be that the uh, cable, despite having uh, a much higher propagation delay than another one, was able to link up with a greater number of, uh, of devices. So in general, this leads us to two sort of overarching conclusions for our paper. Uh, one is that going beyond 100 meters is possible, but it yields a mixed amount of success. So it really depends on the active equipment itself, uh, and how much margin you have to uh, the application that you're trying to support with the cable link segment. Uh, but if you are going beyond 100 meters, it would seem that 22 gauge cable uh, has a higher success rate than 23 gauge cable, which would make sense because when you start getting out to longer distances, you need to worry about uh, insertion loss, attenuation, the signal to noise ratio uh, becoming inadequate for whatever application you're trying to support. Uh, and one way to do that would be to increase the uh, magnitude of your signal. And one way to achieve that is to uh, use a cable design that minimizes the attenuation uh, from extended length. So it would seem logical that uh, 22 gauge cables would be uh, suitable for uh, applications beyond 100 meters. Uh, and that's what the results of our uh, study showed. And with that, I will open it up to some Q&A. Excellent. Uh, again, a great presentation, Mike. We thank you for, for presenting that uh, important topic uh, in today's webinar. Uh, I remind the, uh, the attendees to kindly enter any questions that you have at this time, and we'll, we'll ask them of uh, Mike uh, as, as time permits. I see, Mike, um, one question. Uh, why a gel-filled CAT6A? What is the main benefits of gel-filled cable and intended applications? So gel -filled, the gel-filled cable that we looked at was intended for outdoor applications. So it's for um, moisture mitigation. Uh, and the reason why we actually chose it for the study was because we knew it would affect propagation delay uh, rather significantly just because of the uh, dielectric properties of the gel. Um, but in terms of what gel filled cables are used for in general, uh, it'd be outdoor applications, which is an area where you might see ex people trying to ex do extended distance applications as well. Like you might have a, a POE, cam POE camera out in a parking lot somewhere, uh, and it's more than, uh, more than 100 meters from your, your TR or something, and you, and you just need that little bit of extra length to get out to it. So uh, it, it was chosen. Uh, like I said, just because of the properties we expected uh, that its propagation delay would be worse, but also because it's something that you might see used for an extended distance application. And, and does the, the gel itself provide any uh, additional benefits for the transmission properties to, to help extended distance? Uh, well, you would expect it to be actually, uh, it, it, it would seem to uh, be a detriment to extended di extended distance applications is what you would expect. Uh, well, the, the thought would be that propagation delay would be very negatively affected by it. And we thought that propagation delay would be something that would be crucial for extended distance applications. Um, so it wouldn't provide any benefit, but from our study, it seemed like it didn't necessarily hurt it either. Good, great. Um, I, the, the actual question is, uh, uh, no effect of, of next or fixed uh, on the parameters like return loss. Uh, do they matter? 
we didn't delve too deeply into that with uh, with this study, just because we wanted to concentrate primarily on the uh, parameters that would uh, that would be most greatly affected by extended extended distances. Now, granted, you are going to see differences in next infects based on uh, extended length applications, but we didn't necessarily look at that for this because we wanted to we wanted to narrow the scope uh, in terms of what we were looking at. But um, it does contribute to the signal to noise ratio. So I don't see any reason why it wouldn't contribute. It may be one of those things where you need the uh, next infects to meet a certain uh, a certain benchmark. And then beyond that, you just need to make sure that the insertion loss is uh, adequate enough. Very good. Um, you mentioned using PoE devices. Did the tests include uh, PoE transmission along with data transmission? In some ways it did. Um, but we didn't, th there were some combinations where we were connected like a PoE switch to a PoE device. Um, and generally what we saw is that in all the instances, it was able to power that device um, at at least the uh, like class one PoE. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't try to support any sort of like 100 watt PoE out at 200 meters or anything like that. Uh, so there was there was some indirect PoE testing, but it wasn't the concentration of the paper. Okay. And uh, did you find that uh, multi-gig switch uh, at 100 base T operated better or worse than a true 100 base T switch? It, it was actually kind of interesting, but the, the uh, multi-gig switches that we looked at seemed to have probably the greatest difficulty uh, working at extended length applications, regardless of it, of whether or not it was like 100 base T or 1000 base T, um, it seemed that like pure 10100 or 10100 1000 base T switches were the ones that were able to support these extended length applications the best. Um, even like 10G base T switches seem to have more trouble than pure 10100 1000 base T. Great. Okay, uh, we'll ask for. Any final questions? Becky, do you see any questions, other questions that uh, I may have missed? Dave, I do not see any additional questions at this time. Okay, well, keep track if, if there are any last, uh, last minute uh, questions, uh, please enter them now. And again, we'll try to reach back to Mike. Uh, meanwhile, I'll, um, I'll Go ahead and, and, and thank Mike again for presenting this uh, very interesting and important topic. Uh, again, you can find his paper uh, on our website archived as paper 5-4 in the uh, IWCS 2020 archives. This uh, webinar will also be recorded and posted on our webinar page on the IWCS.org website, as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, in addition, uh, please note the contact points that I have here, uh, should you wish to contact Mike after today's event. Um, and again, uh, IWCS webinar series uh, does present technical papers uh, that have been presented at IWCS and we'll continue to do so uh, once or twice a month going forward. In addition, we'll have other webinar uh, events for uh, exhibitor spotlights or company spotlights for our sponsors. Um, our next webinar event is scheduled for Friday, September 17th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA. So uh, you will be uh, receiving a notification and announcement for this event here shortly. And please feel free to share these announcements uh, with your colleagues so that they can join in and register as well. Uh, again, Becky, any, any questions okay. that have come in? Yes, we received one more question. Uh, okay. The question is, could it be that the multi-gig switches have a delay requirement and that is what made them perform worse? Uh, it's possible. Uh, I will say that the uh, uh, Ethernet FIs aren't exactly my area of expertise. I know like the, the cable link segments, and I know uh, generally the, uh, the 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 form of the uh, um, how how data is transmitted, like via uh, PAM5, NRZ, things like that. But in terms of the propagation delay requirements of 
uh, the multi gig switches themselves. I can't necessarily say, but that is definitely something that uh, it could be possible. I mean, it all depends on uh, how much of a buffer the uh, the different ports have. Um, maybe they can't. Um, maybe it, it could be to the point where propagation delay uh, causes data to be dropped uh, via the buffer um, at the different endpoints. So it's it's possible, but not something we uh, wasn't anything I really considered for the paper. Very good. So again, we thank you uh, for participating and, and asking those excellent questions uh, to Mike. Uh, I do want to mention that uh, for 70 years, uh, the IWCS Cable and Connectivity Industry Forum uh, has been the recognized leader showcasing new technologies and in, in the cable and connectivity products, processes, and applications areas. And uh, we, we could not do this without uh, the, the support of our partner level sponsors. And uh, you can see the, the prominent suppliers in our industry who uh, help us to, uh, to provide these important technical contributions in our industry. And uh, we thank them immensely. Uh, our next uh, conference, as uh, you know, is coming up in a few short weeks. Uh, it will take place virtually, unfortunately, but we're still dealing with obviously the effects of the pandemic. Uh, we are hopeful and, and very positive that we'll be back together again in person in Providence in October of 2022. At the virtual conference, uh, you can read more about it and get our preliminary program from our website. It will be held uh, on Monday through Friday, October 4th through October 8th. Uh, please watch your inbox and your social media uh, areas and, and our website, of course, uh, on how to register uh, and learn more about uh, the exciting uh, event and presentations that, uh, that are going to be provided to you. Uh, registration discounts are available right now, so we encourage you to register as soon as possible to take advantage of some significant cost discounts. Uh, again, you can find all the information you need on our IWCS.org website. So again, thank you for participating. Mike, we greatly appreciate you and, and uh, your great presentation. And that concludes today's event. So uh, take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.